Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We're glad to have some visitors. Always glad to have visitors here at Northside. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to you in song as well as from the preached word of God. Now if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 3, will you please? If you have the original Scofield reference Bible, it's found on page 542. Nehemiah chapter 3. While you're turning there, I want to just mention our cassette tape. The tape this morning, and we are taping the entire Sunday morning program, music, singing, and also the message. And tape today will be tape number 169. Tape number 169. I'm speaking on the gospel in the gates of Jerusalem. We'll send you this list of 168 of our tape. We send them out for a gift of $3 for each tape, and the gift is yours to help defray the radio expense. You pray for us and write to us. We work us together in getting out the gospel. Our radio ministry goes into many, many homes, business places, and prisons. We get letters from prisons in Atlanta, North Georgia, down here in Macon. And we go into a couple of homes and hospitals. And it's a great home mission work. And if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you be tuned to this station tomorrow morning at 12, 12 noon, you can get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday. And if you tune in and get our daily broadcast, we'll endeavor to be a blessing to you on that as well. So you turn now to Nehemiah chapter 3. Now my message is based upon the entire chapter, but I'm not going to take the time to read the entire chapter. But I want you to open your Bible and keep that Bible open at Nehemiah chapter 3, page 542 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I do have a few of those Bibles in my office. I'll get them for you for a discount, save you some money on them. I'm not in the Bible selling business, but I try to keep a few for our members and those that like to have the original Schofield Reference Bible, the old King James Version. I wouldn't be found dead in the woods with any other kind of version. I like the old King James. That's the best yet. Never be one to equal it. Never be one to be uh, superior to the old King James Version. These liberals, modernists, infidels, and whatnot can make all the translations they please, but they'll never come up to the old King James Version. So I'm giving you time now to turn to Nehemiah chapter 3. I'll read another verse of Scripture pertaining to Gates. You don't have to turn there in Psalms 24-7. Not too many days hence, I'll be visiting this wall again in Jerusalem. Been there 11 times. And there's an eastern gate over there that's closed. According to Ezekiel chapter 44, that gate will not be open until Jesus comes. And when he comes, he'll cross the Kidron Valley and go into that eastern gate. We'll mention the eastern gate in our message this morning. You know, children are amazing what they hear and what they do and what they say. I was reading the other day about this little boy in the Sunday school class. The teacher was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and Lot's wife. And the teacher said, you know, Lot's wife turned and looked back and she turned into a pill of salt. The little boy said, you know, my mama turned and looked back one time and then turned into a telephone pole. And so you better watch where you're going as you sojourn. Now in... Psalms chapter 24 and verse 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. That's Psalms chapter 24 and verse 7. In this wall around the city of Jerusalem, they had 12 gates in those days. Nehemiah had gone back from Babylon to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. In those days, they kept strong walls around their villages and cities, on account of uh, being in danger of attack from some other little nation, they did not have communications, radios, automobiles, or whatnot like we have today. And they had their watchtowers where they could watch out for the enemy to see if they were coming in from any direction. 
and they erected these walls. Now we have ten walls here in this particular uh, chapter. I want to touch on all ten. I won't be able to say too much about each one, but we can find the gospel in all ten of these walls, uh, these gates rather than the walls around uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem. And so we start with gate number one, and that's the sheep gate in verse one. And they build the sheep gate, they sanctified and set up the door of it. Now here the sheep gate, of course, is, was erected near the temple. It's where the sheep is brought in to be offered on the altar. Now we know that the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearer is dumb, so it openeth not his mouth. The Bible tells us Jesus was brought as a sheep, as a lamb. Jesus was the Lamb of God. And next to that we find the Bible tells us that there's the uh, Jericho, the men, the, the men built, of uh, uh, Jericho built also, which is a type of a curse. Christ bore our cross, and the curse of sin, and curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. That's not without great significance in this line of thought about the sheep gate. Now we must become sheep of his pasture. That's step number one. If you don't belong to the family of God, if you've never been born again, you're not the sheep of his pasture. In Psalms chapter 79 and verse 13, So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever, and will show forth thy praises to all generations. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 14, I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep and know them mine. So today, if you're a true believer, if you've been saved, you're a sheep in the pasture of God, and he is your great shepherd. And you need to realize that. So they built the sheep gate number one. So first of all, you must become a sheep. You must become a saint of God. Or you can never amount to anything for God. Remember that. Then we move from gate number one to gate number two. And that's found in verse three. And it says the fish gate did the sons of Hassanarath build. And so here we find them building the um, uh, fish gate. The fish gate comes second. Now the fish gate reminds us of a grave responsibility that we have, and that is we're to become fishers of men. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus likened soul winning as to fishing. Now most of you no doubt like to fish in the spring and the summer. You go out fishing and you enjoy it, and you like that. And of course, uh, God wants us to be fishers of men. That is, catch men for Jesus. And he said to his apostles, Now you follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 35, Look on the fields, for the what already for harvest. There's never been a time in the history of mankind when there's so many fish in the pond, or so many people that need to be saved as in this hour in which we live. And we have so few that's trying to win people to God. Dwight L. Moody was a great soul winner, and personally, he won multitudes to God. Sam Jones is a great soul winner, a great preacher, won multitudes to God. Moody robbed hell of over a million souls in his day. He forever went out trying to win people to God. He was not in a man's presence, but just a matter of seconds, he'd find out whether or not that man knew anything about the Jesus Christ or had he been saved. Dwight let nobody slip through his hands without telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was never an ordained preacher, just a lay speaker. God used him as a mighty soul winner, and he won over a million souls to Jesus Christ. God wants us to be soul winners, fishers of men, going out catching men and women for God. Seven years ago, he and my pastor, we had a young man that was a young minister, he was employed here in the city of Athens, but he lived out in Madison County. On the way home one afternoon, he picked up a man just down the way here, short way from this church, a hitchhiker. The reason he picked that young man up, he wanted to tell him about Jesus. And so he had his Bible there placed on the seat where the man was to sit down. And then that man had to move that Bible to sit down in the automobile. Now he did that deliberately. So the man would see the Bible, and that would kind of give an open door an opportunity to speak to him. The man picked the Bible up, moved it over and sat down. And the man was very nervous. And this young boy began to tell him about Jesus. And the man started speaking about what he had done in uh, 
Japan in World War II, how he'd killed the Japs and how cruel he'd been and how mean he'd been to his family and started talking in that manner. But this young preacher boy just kept telling him about Jesus. Kept him right to the point. Jesus died for you, paid your sin debt. You need God. You need to be saved. The man was very nervous. They rode on for about 15 miles. And there this a young preacher boy warned this man to Jesus Christ. They came to the place where he was to turn off to go into his home. And he pulled over beside the road. And the young man thanked him for winning him to Jesus. Reached on the inside of his pocket and pulled out a revolver. And said, young man, I'm going to give you the gun that I fully intended to have taken your life with. Taken your automobile and what you had on your person. And go on my way. That was my full intention when I got in this automobile to kill you, dispose of your body, take your car and what you had. But you started talking about the Lord and about Jesus and I got so nervous that I couldn't do it. And I realized I was wrong. I shouldn't do it. He said, young man, since now I'm saved, I'm so glad that I know Jesus. I want you to take this gun. I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to cross this highway and hitchhike back home. I'm going back to my wife and children. And I want you to pray for me. From now on, I plan to live for Jesus. The young man laid him out, took his gun. And the man went on to his home there in the country. And the hitchhiker caught a ride back in the other direction in which they came. Had he not told him about Jesus Christ, that man fully intended to have murdered him, taken his money in his automobile, disposed of his body, and travel on north. It pays to witness for Jesus Christ. Then we come to gate number three, and that's the old gate. In verse six, move the old gate repaired, Jehoiada, the son of Basir. There they repaired the old gate, the Bible said. And in Jeremiah chapter six and verse 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths, wherein is a good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You cannot beat the old-fashioned way. You cannot improve on the old book of God. It's forever settled in heaven. That's why earlier I mentioned the old King James Version. You can't improve upon it. I don't care how hard you try. This blessed old book of God is settled in heaven forever. And I'm an old-fashioned gospel preacher and always will be. I believe in the old-fashioned way. In Psalms 119, it said, Forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven. So you can't change God's word. God says don't add to it. Don't take from it. Remain at the old gate. Stay in the old paths. Some people may think you just fresh out of Noah's Ark. But that doesn't matter. You serve the Lord. Honor God and do it in the old-fashioned way. And you'll always be glad that you did. Regardless of what people might think about you or say about you. You serve the Lord in the old-fashioned way. And you can't go wrong. So I must move along hurriedly. Let's go to gate number four. Gate number four is the valley gate in verse 13. Said the valley gate repaired Hanum. Now the valley gate is a gate that led out of Jerusalem down to the valley. When you left Jerusalem, the old city, and went out the valley gate, you went down to uh, Jerusalem there and down into a valley. Many times during your lifespan and mine, and if we tarry along on the earth, probably many times again, that's coming a time when you're going through a valley. A valley, a time when you'll be troubled and worried. In Psalms chapter 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So there'll be times when you go through a valley. Pardon me for using my family as an illustration, but it's so fitting that I do so at this particular time. Many years ago, when our oldest granddaughter, Robin Dover, was just a little small child, just a little cute little baby, uh, she took seriously ill. She had virus pneumonia. She was placed in the hospital and seemed like getting worse all the time. We were greatly concerned about it. It was almost Christmas time. One morning, my daughter, Joan, her mother, called me from the hospital and said, Daddy, if you and Mama want to see little Robin alive, you better come on up here. said, seemed like the doctor doesn't give her much hope. My wife and I jumped in the automobile and it's almost Christmas and we started crying and we went up all the way to the hospital and we said, Lord, we just want one Christmas present this year, just one. If you let little Robin live, that's all we want. If we can just keep her, 
That's all we want, Lord. Would you please spare her a little life and let us keep her? And we wept and we cried all the way to the hospital. When we arrived at the general hospital, there my daughter's weeping and her husband, and, and there's a stitch in this room. And we walked in and they had her under a uh, canvas. So you know what to put them under. I call it a canvas, but you know what I'm talking about. So she could breathe. There's pumping oxygen to her. A little uh, body, mouse, nose, so she could breathe and look like every breath would be the last one. We fell down on our knees and began to pray. We said, God, won't you spare our baby? Won't you spare little Robin? Lord, please do and do your blessed will. We all prayed and we wept. We looked to God there in the hospital room. We got up off our knees and she was breathing more easily. And she began to amend from that very moment. And she kept getting better and better and better. And finally we brought her home. And she's sitting here in this auditorium today. You've heard her sing on this broadcast. She's been with me to the, in the, to the Holy Land four times. She sang over there many times. She's a great blessing every time she went. We'll be going back pretty soon. She won't be going this time because she's planning a great hanging. She's going to get hung. She's going to get married. But anyways... Uh, she was always a blessing and blessed our hearts and sang in many places in the Holy Land on the bus and sang on this broadcast and she's a beautiful, lovely young lady and God spared her life and we were going through a deep valley at that time and we thought we were going to lose her but God pulled us through the valley and spared her life for a purpose and a reason and we thank God for it. There are going to be times when you're going through a valley now, if you haven't been, you will be, and that's the valley gate. Number five is the dung gate, and I must hurry. Number 14, but the dung gate repaired Melchiah. Now, this is a gate where at nighttime, they'd carry the garbage out this gate and get it out of the city and carry it down to be burned. There they would take the garbage out at the dung gate. Now, that speaks of one thing, and that is, as far as we're concerned, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these precious promises, dear beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all fillings of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God wants us to be clean and holy and pure. Your body belongs to God. That's the vessel in which God dwells. And God wants you to know that and realize that. That was a little girl one time to ask her mother what made the flowers grow. And before mother could answer, she said, well, I guess I just want to get up out of the dirt. Now, if you want to grow as a Christian, stay out of the dirt. Get up out of the dirt. Clean yourself up. Live for God. Be holy. Be pure. Be clean. Paul said, I count all things but dung that I might win Christ. Paul said, everything I cast away that I might win Jesus Christ. Be a clean vessel. Preacher friend of mine many years ago drove up in the mountains. I don't know whether Tennessee, North Carolina, where, but way up in the mountains. Became very thirsty. Riding along a hot trail and in the summertime, and he wanted some water very badly, and he stopped beside of a little old cabin, mountain home there, and he saw a very stout lady sitting on the porch there, snuff running down her chin, and it looked like she'd combed her hair a year or two and hadn't had a bath in months, and sitting there greasy looking, dirty, filthy looking. He said to her, he said, Lady, I'm a preacher and evangelist traveling through this area. And I'm real thirsty. Do you happen to have a place around here I get a drink of water? She said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. A lot of people come by wanting some water. We'll have a spring down here. And he said, I'd certainly appreciate it if you'd show it to me. So she said, I'll go down and show you where it is. So she wobbled off the porch and down the path and went down to the spring. And the spring was deep down in some rocks. And they had to dip it out with a long gourd. And they had that only gourd there to drink the water from. And... He looked at that gourd and it looked pretty bad around the edge of it. And he looked at that woman, all that snuff all over her mouth and hadn't had a bath a long time. And uh, he thought, now, I, can't, I can't very well drink out of that gourd. I'm about to starve. I know what I'll do. You notice there's a hole in the end of that gourd in the handle. Didn't look too good around the end of it, but he thought, I'll drink out of it anyway. So he just dipped the water up in the gourd and let the handle come toward his mouth. And he drank out of that end of that handle. That woman started laughing. She started shaking all over and just laughing, laughing. He said, woman, what are you laughing about? She said, well, you're the only person that come through here and drank now that gourd that drinks out of it the same way I do. So we need to kind of 
get cleaned up and stay clean, that people will mind drinking out of the same gourd, as it were. So there is the dung gate. Then we come to gate number six, and that's the gate of the fountain. In verse 15, but the gate of the fountain repaired Shalom. Now in John chapter 4, verse 14, but the water I shall give him shall be him a well, or in him a well of water springing up in everlasting light. In John chapter 7, verse 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Read Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, and read about God's great fountain. So there's a gate of the fountain. God wants you to come and drink at his great fountain. If you've been saved, in you is a spring of living water. But that can spring up to the glory of God and, and go out and flow out and be a blessing. So God wants you by all means to hang around the fountain. As Evangelist Mays Jackson used to sing a little chorus, I want to stay at the spout where the glory comes out. There I remain where there's plenty of rain. So hang around God's fountain and God will bless you as you drink from the fountain of God. That moves us to Watergate, uh, the gate number seven. Watergate, where would that come from? All right, gate number seven, verse 26. Moreover, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel under the place over against the Watergate. Well, the Bible does talk about Watergate, doesn't it? doesn't talk about Dick Nixon's Watergate, but uh, it's the Watergate in the Bible. But you notice it mentioned no repair. There's no repair for this gate. You'll read it here, you see that. The reason is it's a symbol of God's Word. You don't have to change or bring up to date or modernize the Word of God. If you do that, then you're wrecking the Word of God. You're, you're butchering up the Bible. I saw in the latest Reader's Digest where they're advertising the Reader's Digest Bible. That thing is a perverted uh, book. I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't have it in my home. I wouldn't want it in my garbage can. Don't you go for that. All they did was butch up the Bible and it did that to make money off of it, to sell it. And gullible people will buy it. That's why they have these new translations. They want to make money off of them. That's the reason. And so it said here something about the water gate. And Ezra had his pulpit near the water gate. And from the pulpit came the word of God. John chapter 15 verse 3. Now you're clean through the water, the word rather, I've spoken unto you. Read John chapter 17 verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 26 through 27. And you see that water is a symbol of the word of God as well as the spirit of God. Then we move from this particular gate, the water gate, over to the horse gate. They had what they call the horse gate in verse 28. Notice that. From above the horse gate repaired the priest, everyone over against his house. Now the horse gate there speaks of power. When you read about a horse in the Bible, you... You're a mind of power. Because the Bible says in Job chapter 13, uh, 39 and verse 19, Has thou given the horse strength? Has thou closed his neck with thunder? So the horse in the Bible, especially in those days, speaks of great power. The horse speaks of warfare. The horse gate speaks of warfare. Through this gate, the army went to battle. Through this gate, David reviewed his troops. Here at the horse gate, King David would stand there. Those great soldiers would go out on their horses. He'd view them as they went by, saw who they were, how many went out to battle. And so the horse gate speaks of power. Now we need to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, endured with power from on high. The Bible said you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now we need the power of God to witness, to win souls, to live right as we should. So that's the horse gate. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that you don't need the power of God in your life. Amen. You really do. As Havner said, we're living a firecracker life in an atomic age. It's a shame as a Christian to live a firecracker life in an atomic age, spiritually speaking. That is when we have so many Bibles and, and people that love the Lord. And we shouldn't live a firecracker life. Then we come to gate number nine, and that's the East Gate. Now I spoke of the east gate, the golden gate a moment ago. In the book of uh, Ezekiel chapter 44, the Bible tells you there that the eastern gate is closed. I've shown you that on slides. I brought back from the Holy Land many times. That gate is sealed. It's closed. Nobody will go through that gate till Jesus comes. 
And when Jesus comes and plants his feet on the Mount of Olives, he'll cross the Kidron Valley, and he will go through that eastern gate. But nobody goes through there until Jesus comes. There is eastern gate. In, in verse 29, notice it says, the keeper of the east gate. Now the east gate was the first gate open in the morning. Night had passed, and day had come, and light came in. So the eastern gate was opened up. Night gone, day come, light had come. He opened the eastern gate. One of these days, at the close of this dark age, Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And he will open that eastern gate. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, it shineth even on the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this eastern gate speaks of the bright and the morning star. One of these days he will appear, and when he does, we'll go out to meet him in the air. That brings us to gate number 10, the final one, and that's gate Mifkad. Now gate Mifkad is not without significance. Verse 31, take a look at it there. Over against the gate, Mithkad. Now, the word Mithkad means a review. Uh, means that we're checked over. Uh, we're taking a look at. And so, over against the gate, Mithkad, a place of review. Now, David reviewed his troops after the battle. When they went out to battle and came in, David stood at the gate, Mithkad. And there he reviewed his troops to see what they looked like. Whether they had been wounded or hurt or how many lost as he came through the gate Mithkad. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the Bible says, Put him in once to die, and after that the judgment. We're going to appear at the gate Mithkad. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Where we'll be judged. Now, if you notice here, I started at gate number 1 in verse 1, and that was a sheep gate. And the sheep gate reminds us of Jesus. The Lamb of God. I went all the way around the wall of Jerusalem, ended up at the gate Mifkad, right back at the sheep gate. The last gate there, the place of review. So we start with Jesus, and we end up with Jesus. We start with the Lord when we're saved. We end up with him yonder in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. Beloved, have you entered in as yet? If not, you need to enter in now. Because the point of the men wants to die, and after that, the judgment. You start with Jesus, the sheep gate. You end up with Jesus, the Mifkad gate, at the rapture at the and at the judgment seat of Christ. Be ye all so ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So it pays to be ready. Not only that, but sinners today are facing double danger. They are facing death, and they're facing the coming of the Lord. If they're not saved and Jesus comes, their feet will never leave the earth. They'll be left here at the rapture. But if they're saved, they'll be caught out at the rapture. Every lost person, listen to me today, you're facing double danger. You're facing death. People are dying every day. It's not safe anywhere anymore. I don't care where you are, it's not safe. Remember you on Atlanta last week? Man working down the post office, pulled out a gun, killed two men, wounded another. Well, they never thought of anything like that. You're not safe anywhere anymore. You must remember that. Something could happen to you most any place at any time. I'm not trying to intimidate you. I'm giving you cold facts. You need to be ready to face God. If you're not saved, you ought to repent right now. Get out on your knees. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me for Jesus' sake. And let the Lord come into your heart. Remember this message and the music's on tape 169. It's available for a $3 gift on the radio broadcast. Let us all stand when you please. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and that you use it and the gospel here we found in the gates of Jerusalem. I pray that you use it to strengthen and feed and help thy people and to warn that lost man of the error of his way that he might repent and turn to God. Father, have you in this invitation, I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David's going to play for us on the organ as she plays. If you're here this morning unsaved, if you're here this morning backslidden, if you're here looking for a church home, or for any other reason you feel like that you need to come forward, I want you to come and we'll help you every way we possibly can that you need. Would you come while we wait? Is God speaking to your heart? Do you need to get saved? Do you need to come back to the Lord? 
Do you need a Bible-believing church home? An old-fashioned, fundamental, independent missionary Baptist church. How about it? Why we wait? We want to give you ample time to respond. like the Lord may be speaking. Just a moment, we're going. Are you sure that you're doing what God told you to do? 